Greetings. This is Echo 3, and let's discuss the Nerve Engine. Recently, someone was watching one of my tutorials and was really curious how did my craft have so much Delta V? And the very simple answer is that I was using the Nerve Engine. Now this tutorial video is going to be a little different. It is a double feature. I'm going to demonstrate how to use the Nerve Engine in both KSB 1 and 2. Here, in the original game, the Nerve Engine only uses liquid fuel. And because of that, it is best to use fuel tanks that only hold liquid fuel. And these are typically the same fuel tanks that you would use when making an airplane. If you still want to use one of the tanks that hold liquid fuel and oxygen, remember to drain all of the oxygen out of those tanks. Since the Nerve Engine can't make use of any of that oxygen, it just ends up as useless mass on the craft. I'm making use of a few struts just to help give a little extra stability to my custom fuel tank. And the best tank to use in terms of its mass compared to its volume is actually the Mark Zero fuel tank. But using lots of those ends up with a very high part count. Since there aren't any large fuel tanks for just holding liquid fuel, I tend to make my own custom tanks like this. The Nerve engines themselves tend to be pretty heavy. They are three tons a piece. So even though the engine has a specific impulse of 800 seconds, its high mass means that the engine is really only useful on larger crafts. Another thing to consider when using the Nerve engine is that it has much lower thrust than the chemical engines. A Nerve engine only produces 60 kilonewtons of thrust. And in thick atmosphere, like near Kerbin surface, that value drops down to just 13. Because of its lower thrust, the engine is not always a very good choice for landers. If you watched my Cold War series, I made several shuttles that went to Duna that made use of the Nerve Engine. This is to say that the Nerve Engine can be used on landers, you just need to take into account its lower thrust to weight ratio. Duna's atmosphere is very thin, so engines that work well in a vacuum still tend to work very well on Duna surface. But that is definitely not the case for Kerbin surface. That is why I'm building this massive booster section to get my nerve-powered upper stage into orbit. I am making use of a feature called Auto Struts. This will help keep the rocket a little bit more rigid as it ascends through the atmosphere. If you are new to the game and don't see an option for Auto Struts, that means you need to turn on Advanced Tweakables in the game settings to be able to view this. Now I'm adding just a few fins to the bottom of the rocket to help with more stability. I don't have anything in particular in mind for this rocket. I'm just demonstrating how to use the Nerve Engine. You could watch one of my tutorials, such as the one where I go to Moho and see how useful the engines are. For large cruiser sections, the Nerve Engine is one of the best engines in the game. These engines also have alternators, which means that they will generate electricity when they're running, but I did add a couple solar panels to this rocket, so that it'll still be able to generate electricity even when the engines aren't firing. On the bottom right of the screen, you can see the Delta V readout for the different stages. But my preference is still the Kerbal Engineer. That is a mod, and you can see its display at the top left. It is probably my absolute favorite mod, just because of all the information that it is able to display. Alternatively, one could also use the mod MechJeb to get about the same information. Now it's time to take this rocket out to the launch pad and see just how well it performs. Since this is a two-stage rocket, the goal of the first stage, or the booster stage, is to get the upper stage out of the thick, lower atmosphere of Kerbin. Specifically, the goal is to get this rocket traveling as fast as possible at an altitude around 250 kilometers above Kerbin's surface. Because the thrust-to-weight ratio on the upper stage is pretty low, it can be helpful to circularize at a much higher altitude. A high orbit is beneficial with a craft that has a low thrust-to-weight ratio. Because of the lower thrust-to-weight ratio, the craft needs to take into account cosine losses when making long burns. But with a higher orbit, cosine losses will be less of an issue. In simple terms, cosine losses become very apparent when your maneuver vector differs significantly from your prograde or retrograde vector. So for burns that take a very long time, you'll notice the craft has to start burning more radial in, and then as it gets past the maneuver node, more radial out. The end result, then, is that your craft took far more delta-v to perform the maneuver than what it calculated in the game. And that, then, is what is referred to as a cosine loss. The craft now is approaching a maneuver node, 
and it appears, looking at the numbers, that after the craft completes its circularization burn, that it will still have over 10,000 meters per second of delta V here in low Kerbin orbit. If so desired, one could add a docking port and a small lander and take this to almost any planet or moon in the Kerbal system. And there you have the basics of using the Nerve Engine in the original KSP. Up next, the Nerve Engine in KSP2. Most of the parts that one is familiar with in the first game are also available in the sequel. The new vehicle assembly building is much larger, and this can make large crafts easier to assemble. Personally though, I find the user interface too large and clunky. In the sequel, the Nerve Engine uses a new fuel type called Hydrogen, so you have to use the specially designed hydrogen tanks. The engine plates from Making History have been brought over as the engine mounts, and these are very handy if you want to use multiple engines on a stage. But a new, large Nerve Engine has been added to the game. The original Nerve Engine has been upgraded for KSP-2. It still masses 3 tons, but now produces 75 kilonewtons of thrust instead of 60, and had its specific impulse increased from 800 to 900. The new Swerve Engine is even better. With a mass of 10 tons, it produces 700 kilonewtons of thrust in a vacuum, and has a specific impulse of 1,450 seconds. This then easily gives my upper stage over 12,000 meters per second of delta V. The Swerve Engine still doesn't perform well in the lower atmosphere, and will need a booster section to get it high enough so it'll be useful. Here in KSP2, they did get rid of some of the larger engine sections that the developers considered redundant. So I'll be making use of my own cluster of vector engines. Here I'm checking the starting thrust to weight ratio of my craft. At this time, KSP2 does not display your thrust to weight ratio for any other stages. This can make designing landers a little bit more tricky. Hopefully, it won't be very long before developers include more tools for displaying information. A nice change from the original is the inclusion of some procedural parts, like wings. This can greatly reduce your part count when you're making airplanes. I'd love to see the inclusion of more procedural parts, but given the current state of the game, that's pretty low on my wish list. Currently, there are no auto struts in KSP-2, and this craft is going to need some regular struts to help keep it stable. Rockets in the sequel seem to be a lot more floppy. I'm not a game programmer, but it is my thinking that there are some values as far as how rigid and how strong joints are that need to be increased. Specifically, across this joint where the rocket tapers down, it needs added reinforcement. Adding struts seems to help with some of my issues, although it would be nice if the option for auto struts or something like that would be added for the sequel. I'm going to add just a few more struts just to help make sure this lower stage holds together. And with that, let's try testing this rocket out as well. In many ways, the graphics are a huge improvement over the original game, and I am really enjoying the sound design. I do play with a pretty large screen though, and it would be nice if there was an option to change the size of the user interface. This is an option in the original game, and I tend to have mine scaled down to around 80 or 90%. So having the ability to scale the user interface is something else I'd also like to see added to the game. And that's a feature I can see getting added in later, it's just not a very big priority at this time. I have the volume in the game turned down quite a bit right now, but I am really enjoying the new music that they have added. So my lower stage is way more powerful than I need it to be. I'm going to go ahead and ditch it before I finish circularizing around Kerbin. But this craft is easily going to have more than 12,000 meters per second of delta V here in low Kerbin orbit. So here in KSP-2, the nerve and swerve engines have become even more useful than the nuclear engines in the original game. They are able to make traveling between the planets even easier. Several people have been wanting to know what am I going to be doing now that I have finished my KSP-1 Cold War series? Initially, it was my thought to try and continue with peaceful exploration in KSP-2. However, in its current state, this sequel does not give me peace. I find that the game brings me more frustration than fun. Hopefully, and hopefully very soon, the developers will be releasing patches to fix some of the issues with this early access. And I'm really wanting that this clunky maneuver system that they have right now will get a little bit of an upgrade very soon. Already, the modding community has been active, adding fixes to the game. If you want to see what's available, head over to the official Kerbal Space Program forum. Most of the mod makers tend to be very active over there. 
This has been a little demonstration of how to use the NERV engines in both the original KSP and in Kerbal Space Program 2. I am Echo 3, and thanks for joining me on this NERV engine discussion. I will see you next time.